So before we get into today's episode, I just wanna let you all know about a little secret project that I've been creating behind the scenes. I've made a new channel called Thinkology. If you like some slightly shorter content than my main channel from time to time where not everything is super sad or upsetting, then make sure to check out this new channel. While I'm not the one voicing on it, I have sourced some amazing talent to help bring this new channel to life. This new channel will cover history on Mondays, creepy or spooky things on Tuesdays, nature on Wednesdays, crime on Thursdays, and trivia on Fridays. So if any of those things interest you and you just want some more good old fashioned research content to make it through the day, make sure to check out Thinkology or click the link in the description box to make sure it sends you to the right channel. Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and people that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati and today we are back at it again with part three of the Disney series. And I know it's starting to feel like it's never ending, isn't it? Today, we're going to be talking about the immoral, money-hungry machine that is Disney. I would like to start this episode off with a content warning. We will be talking about pedophiles and how Disney has ignored harmful behavior from their workers. Pretty hypocritical, right? As a refresher, in our last episode, we talked about how Disney won't tolerate a beard or hijab as part of the Disney look, but apparently they do tolerate sexual predators. And I know it makes no sense to me either, but anyway, if that's gonna be a little too much for you to handle, I more than understand, and perhaps I'll see you in part four or just a different episode entirely. But for now, we're going to start by talking about the Disney park workers, then get into how Disney continued to grow over the years and how they made their way from the big screen to the parks to the little screen, AKA our televisions. So let's get into it. Since we last left off talking about Disney World, it only seems appropriate to now talk about the times Disney has turned a blind eye to the predatory park workers that they've hired. Now, this has been happening for decades and it's actually incredibly disturbing the response that Disney has taken to many of these cases. As many of these workers are around children, it seems especially important that they go through a background check. And yet, even when Disney does have a reason to believe that someone intends to harm kids or park visitors, they do, well, kind of nothing. We'll see this even more when we talk about the Disney Channel, but as for the park, one of the earliest sources I could find discussing this issue was from the New York Times in 1998. The article reads, with 20 years experience as an investigative reporter, Brian Ross of ABC News knows a good story when he hears one. He's also not stupid. He knew the story he heard last night might raise difficulties because it involved ABC's parent, the Walt Disney Company, but he thought he had enough solid information to pursue it. The story involved accounts of pedophilia and lax security at theme park resorts, including Walt Disney World. And once Mr. Ross and his longtime producer partner, Rhonda Schwartz had finished their reporting, they thought they had a solid investigative piece for 2020, ABC's news magazine program. But the report was killed last week or at least shelved. ABC News executives refused to discuss the reason in detail and have urged those involved to not discuss the matter publicly. Disney issued a statement saying that its executives had nothing to do with the decision. Now, ABC, owned by Disney, shut down a report that investigated pedophilia at their parks and resorts. I desperately tried to find this ABC report, but as far as I was able to discover, it was in fact killed, not just shelved until they could take a look at it or do a more thorough investigation, but that thing is gone. Therefore, I think I feel fairly comfortable in saying that something was probably going on and it was probably suppressed in an attempt to either cover up or ignore that something bad happened. And there's really no excuse for this. ABC works for Disney. I highly doubt Disney had nothing to do with the decision, especially when ABC News didn't hesitate to talk about animal abuse and boycotting stories in the past. For legal reasons, I won't say that Disney themselves 100% killed the story as a cover-up because there is no 100% proof here, but if I were to speculate and make an opinion, it just, it looks a little suspicious. 
As for what I could find about the pedophilia and sexual harassment at the parks, there's a worrying amount of examples, honestly. One source from 2011 said that April Magalone 27 claimed that a Donald Duck cast member grabbed her breast while she was holding her child at the Walt Disney World theme park. According to the Toronto Star, her lawsuit also charges that Disney parks have a history of fondling complaints involving workers and that Disney has condoned their actions, putting profits over public safety. According to Magaloon's suit, authorities in Florida received 24 related complaints in the week after a Walt Disney World employee dressed as Tigger was charged with molesting a 13-year-old girl and her mother in 2004. At least some were deemed credible and investigated by police, the suit said. The man playing Tigger was later acquitted of criminal wrongdoing after his lawyer donned the Tigger costume in court and argued that his client couldn't see much. I guess stay away from the costumed characters because it's just a weird excuse to me, but it worked. Another source says that he suffers from dyslexia, which like I have dyslexia. I'm sure you guys can see that from time to time when I have like when I swap words around and stuff like that, but that's like having dyslexia doesn't mean that you wanna inappropriately touch somebody. So I'm a bit confused how they got to that conclusion. Not to mention Disney costumes have changed a ton throughout the years. Some of the earliest versions of Mickey and Minnie Mouse, specifically the ones in the 50s, legitimately look like nightmare fuel. If their workers are so blind to the point that they can't see that they're groping children, then Disney clearly needed to redesign those costumes. In actuality, this just feels like another pathetic excuse for predatory behavior. Nor was this the only case of pedophilia at the parks. CNN reported this in 2014. Just days after getting arrested in a child sex sting, Robert King Solver is a long way from his beloved job at Walt Disney World. Inside his rented house in a suburban Orlando neighborhood filled with children, he sits in a folding chair in a nearly empty room, wires dangling in the corner where his computer used to be connected. Now he can't be online or near children. My life is ruined, he told CNN in an interview from his home. My family's life is ruined. My kid's life is ruined. I've devastated my parents because of bad judgment. King Solver, 49, is one of at least 35 Disney employees arrested since 2006 and accused of sex crimes involving children, trying to meet a minor for sex or for possession of child pornography. According to a six month CNN investigation that examined police and court records and interviewed law enforcement officials and some of the men who have been arrested. Five Universal Studios employees and two employees from SeaWorld have also been arrested. Robert had tried to solicit sex from a 14 year old online, but was caught in an undercover sting. He claims he was just trying to protect her. Sure, from what, predators like him? Honestly though, I suppose it's not really a surprise that so many pedophiles would work in theme parks where they'd be around children. Now, Disney does require background checks, so I can't really fault them for hiring workers that turned out to be horrible people without their knowledge, but I can fault them for their pretty terrible responses. For example, according to the Orlando Sentinel, one worker was put on unpaid leave in 2015 after being arrested for raping a woman outside of House of Blues in downtown Disney. Now, let me repeat that. This employee raped someone in Disney. There's literally video surveillance of the attack. Records state he confessed to the crime and it was his second time being arrested after leaving the House of Blues. But okay, Disney just put him on leave. For the life of me, I don't see why he wouldn't be fired instantly for this. A few years later in 2019, it only gets worse. In May, 2019, a Magic Kingdom cast member was arrested for trying to arrange a sexual encounter with an eight-year-old. According to my source, Frederick Pohl engaged in a series of online chat communications to arrange a sexual encounter with an eight-year-old girl, believing that he was communicating with the eight-year-old and her father in order to set up a meeting. Pohl sent explicit photos of himself to who he believed was the child. When arriving at the Orlando hotel they had agreed to meet at, Paul was arrested by the undercover federal agent who he was actually communicating with. According to the criminal complaint that was submitted, Paul was found to be in possession of condoms and a child-sized pink dress for the arrangement. Now, he was immediately terminated, thankfully, and sentenced to a minimum of 10 years in prison. Then a few months later on a Disney cruise line, one of the youth counselors was arrested for molesting a 10-year-old child. The Miami Herald reports that Lovett blindfolded a 10-year-old boy and spun him around several times as part of a game. 
It was at that time he fondled the victim's penis outside of the clothing, according to a Miami-Dade police arrest report. The boy also told police that the Disney youth counselor sat next to him while he was playing a game building a house of cards. When Lovett reportedly moved his hand toward the child, the boy covered his genitals, fearing he'd be fondled again. This source listed multiple other examples of sexual molestation on Disney Cruise Lines, even questioning if Disney tried to cover them up in the past. Apparently, even when Disney has had video evidence substantiating children's accounts of them being molested, Disney doesn't report the crime. Instead, in one incident, they waited until the ship was on open waters and headed to the Bahamas. By delaying the reporting of the alleged crime, Disney was able to avoid the US investigation into the incident while making certain that any investigation was handled only on the Bahamas, which theoretically can investigate shipboard crimes because Disney cruise ships fly Bahamian flags of convenience. But the Bahamas has a deplorable record of investigating cruise ship crimes. The news reporter who covered the story, Tony Pipitone, stated in a promotional piece, find out what happened to the 33-year-old man who avoided investigation in Florida, thanks in part to his employers in action. Disney, of course, has been dismissive, done nothing, or actively covered up crimes in multiple instances. Hell, even Disney employees step forward and say that they're being sexually harassed at work and they're just treated horribly. In one lawsuit, a former Disney employee says she was fired for filing a sexual harassment claim against her supervisor. The woman claimed she reported the sexual harassment to upper management and she was met with retaliation and falsely accused of workplace and safety violations that ultimately led to termination of her employment with Disney World. This case, by the way, is still in the works, so I can't confirm that this is exactly what happened yet, but I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if it were true. Disney has had a history of covering up the disturbing acts that happen at their parks. From time to time, they get it right and fire someone on the spot, when said pedophile had been arrested and headed to jail anyway. Otherwise, the amount of leeway they give in this category is really alarming. In addition to the employees, there's the visitors themselves. Some sources have said it's not really clear how Disney searches or flags sex offenders. SeaWorld, Universal, and Disney have all declined to share specifics of their policies regarding the admittance of sex offenders or whether they screen for them. It just like, I don't know. You'd think that after everything we've said, Disney would be eager to prove that it's not only making changes to be the happiest place on earth, but the safest. But unfortunately that just doesn't seem to be the case. Even with this disturbing behavior though, Disney continued to grow. Let's get back to the company itself and see what was going on behind the scenes and in the boardrooms. After Walt Disney was built, the mid to late seventies seemed relatively uneventful in comparison to the early eighties when the Epcot Center was opened. Tokyo Disneyland opened and Disney established Touchstone Pictures. According to my source, at the same time, because of the widespread perception that Disney stock was undervalued relative to the company's assets, two corporate raiders attempted to take over Disney. The efforts to keep the company from being broken up ended when Michael Eisner and Frank Wells became chairman and president respectively. One of these corporate raiders was Saul P. Steinberg, who tried to take over Disney in 1984. He already targeted Chemical Bank and Quaker State, and in March of that year, he bought 6.3% of the company's stock. Eisner was able to stop it, though he was the first CEO to run Disney that wasn't family or didn't have some prior affiliation to the company. And after paying off Steinberg to abandon his takeover attempt, they were hurting. Some even speculated that the payout was Steinberg's plan all along, that he never wanted to take out the company, but that he'd essentially entered into a poker game with Disney and they folded. A New York Times 1984 article at that time wrote, Disney, which had less than 10 million in cash at the end of March, borrowed an entire $325.5 million through a 1.3 billion line of credit bank arranged in late March to purchase the Steinberg holding. This coupled with the addition of 190 million in debt added through its purchase last week of the Arvita Corporation, increased Disney's total debt to $866 million. That is 67% of its total equity compared with a much more conservative 25% prior to Mr. Steinberg's assault. As a result, Disney has made itself much less attractive to any other potential raiders, according to Mr. Eisger, but also created new constraints that will make it more difficult for Disney to develop its real estate and increase its movie production. You'll never know if they gave away too much, he said. To fight it another way may have cost just as much, but Disney is not the plum it used to be. 
Now, obviously we know Disney would and has bounced back, but things certainly were rocky for some time. Even so, Disney wasn't slowing down. The new management team, Eisner and Wells, saw new ways for Disney to maximize its assets. Back then, they seemed fantastic for the company, though in later years, Eisner would be called Disney's demon that committed virtually every executive sin. Today's episode, we're focusing more on the actual crimes of Disney, as I'd say corporate governance is probably the least of their issues. Rest assured though, we'll touch upon this power hungry actions in episode four. Anyway, back in 1983, the company left network television to prepare for the launch of a cable network, the Disney Channel. In 1985, Disney's Touchstone division began the immensely successful Golden Girls. Films from the Disney library were selected for syndication market and some of their classic animated films were released on video cassette. By the early 1990s, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin all proved massive successes with one outdoing the other. And in 1991, Disney began publishing their books. They formed Hyperion Books, purchased Discover Magazine, and opened Disneyland Paris in 1992. The 1990s saw many of the films I'm sure plenty of you might've grown up on. The Lion King, Pocahontas, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hercules, Tarzan, Mulan, Fantasia 2000, and then Toy Story. Also, around the turn of the millennia, Disney stopped airing programming for adults. Ryan Walker in his article, The Evolution of Disney Channel wrote, by 1998, Disney targeted a younger audience with a new channel called Playhouse Disney that offered many educational concepts for preschoolers. I believe that Disney Channel was at its prime when it entered the 2000s. Not only were the shows so purely entertaining, but also tackled real life issues. That's so Raven, The Proud Family had episodes that displayed characters with body image problems, which were helped by the support of family and friends. Also, Lizzie McGuire was a show about a young girl living her adolescent life, but showed relatable reactions to real life situations through her cartoon, Alter Ego. Some honorable mentions of this era are as follows. Kim Possible, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, and lastly, everyone's favorite, Hannah Montana. I'm pretty sure plenty of you grew up watching these shows when they aired, and I remember watching them when I was growing up too. And while these corporate casket episodes largely focus on the negative of companies, considering just how long this Disney series is, I don't wanna pretend that there's no good to be had here either. Researchers have actually proven that through promoting kindness through Disney films, these movies can actually promote pro-social behavior for children of all ages. There's a lot of humanity and warmth in Disney movies and some great moments in their shows too. If you enjoyed them or still do, I'm not trying to send hate your way for that. However, the reason why I emphasize the negative of a company, especially Disney, is because a company is always going to present its best self to the world. Disney will probably always market itself as the happiest place on earth, and you'll probably always be able to get their songs stuck in your head and see their incredibly well animated films and visit their massive theme parks. I don't really need to tell you that, it's shown to us consistently. But what I do want to discuss, no matter how much it hurts, is how those animators were treated, how these park workers are treated, and now the kind of people Disney Channel hired. And I hate to do this to you, but we have to get back into the sexual abuse and pedophiles Disney protected. I know this episode is basically just like the pedophiles of Disney episode, but it's important to recognize how prevalent this really is. Now, before we go back and dive into the grimy and slimy, we're gonna take a moment to place today's ad break here. As many of you know, when I cover lots of sensitive topics, they are often demonetized. And I'm very grateful that I have sponsors that are willing to work with me and support the channel so that I can continue to talk about this type of content, despite the fact that it will be demonetized. So thank you to today's ad sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by Daily Harvest. Now, you guys know the deal. I love and have used Daily Harvest for about, are we going on almost a year? We're getting really close to a year at this point. I'm a huge fan of their smoothies. When they released the ice cream in the summertime, the pistachio, killer, loved it. And now that we're getting into the cooler season is finally, we're starting to enter fall and winter once again. Daily Harvest has got me covered with once again, more smoothies, delicious harvest bowls, flatbreads, and more, all built on organic fruits and vegetables, and they're getting delivered right to your door. Daily Harvest literally takes minutes to prepare and there's no preservatives, added sugar, or artificial anything. Again, like I said, it's built on organic fruits and vegetables that stays fresh in your freezer, so it's ready whenever you're ready. So get some more time back to do you this fall and take care of yourself. Make sure you go to dailyharvest.com slash casket and get up to $40 off your first box. 
That's dailyharvest.com slash casket for up to $40 off your first box. Give them a try and let me know what your favorite smoothie was. Obviously I've mentioned the mint and cacao one, which I'm not a huge fan of until recently, but let me know what smoothies, flatbreads, bowls, whatever you tried and let me know what you thought about it. Again, dailyharvest.com slash casket. This episode is also sponsored by Athena Club. And you guys know the process of shaving your legs, it takes extra time, you're gonna cut yourself, it's expensive, which is probably like the top tier issue here is that shit's pricey. But the truth is we all can use a razor that makes shaving uncomplicated, it's gentle on your skin and it's not gonna kill your bank account. And that's why Athena Razor Club is hands down the best razor I've used. It leaves my skin moisturized, super smooth and bump free. And I mean, it's kind of becoming the gold standard for razors, at least in my book. And Athena Club's razor has built in skin guards and the razor blade is surrounded by a water activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid. And get this, the razor kit in question, it's $9, comes in like, is it like six or eight different colors at this point? It's got so many colors, it comes with an extra blade head and it even has a magnetic hook for storage. So show your skin that you care with the Athena Club razor kit. Sign up today and you'll get 20% off your first order. Just go to athenaclub.com and use promo code casket. That's athenaclub.com, promo code casket for 20% off. Enjoy. Disney has hired a lot of pedophiles on the Disney Channel, but is this a case of Disney hiring them, realizing their mistake and firing them when they show their true colors? Well, let's find out. One of the earliest examples of this that I could find was the powder director, Victor Salva. Back in 1995, one source reads, Powder, a new drama from Walt Disney Hollywood Pictures is creating an uproar because of the criminal record of the film's writer-director, Victor Salva. In 1988, Salva was convicted of molesting Concord actor Nathan Forrest Winters over a four year period starting when the boy was eight years old. So I guess that answers my question I just asked. Disney hired this child molester after the crime was already committed. And from the sounds of the article, considering that people were picketing the screening, it's not as if Disney didn't know about this past either. They were either so negligible in hiring Salva that they didn't bother looking into the crimes he committed or they knew and didn't care. Now, I tried to look into this, and as you guys know, every once in a while, I take a look at Wikipedia because usually they have a bunch of sources and it helps me, you know, guide myself down the right rabbit hole. And the link on Wikipedia says that Disney claims it was the latter, that they stressed there were no minors in the production. But when I go to find the direct source itself and to look into the source a bit more, it was a dead link. So I can't even confirm that Disney said anything at this point. But Even so, why would Disney, a company that largely markets towards children, be fine with supporting a child molester in any capacity? Victor only served one and a half years of a three-year prison sentence, and he abused a child for a four-year period, so he wasn't even punished for as long as he did the damn thing. So great job, Disney, sending a message that you stand by child molesters. Another source states, according to Reuters, a company insider said Disney was concerned because a beautiful movie was being overshadowed by the controversy, adding, we don't do with witch hunts, we're not the CIA, and we don't do security clearances on people. People here are judged by their talent. We're not judging their personal lives. There are lawyers and courts to do that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say like, this PR person, they tried. Like they really, really tried to spin this. But the reality is, if you don't condemn child molesters because you don't judge child people's personal lives, then I've got to wonder where your priorities are. It's good to know that they put that above safety, the well being of children, and above condemning child abuse. Hell, Salva didn't even seem remorseful, which was the bare minimum he could do after molesting a child actor. Instead, he seemed to actively seek jobs working with children. He's written children's books, and just a couple years before he was convicted when the abuse was occurring, he worked at the Crawford Village Child Care Center. So, you know, he surrounded himself with the thing he was apparently interested in, just children. Now, Kevin Spacey is yet another actor that Disney has worked with. According to ABC News, on October 29th, 2017, Star Trek Discovery actor Anthony Rapp alleges in an interview with BuzzFeed News that in 1986, when he was 14, a then 26 year old Spacey climbed on top of him in a bed after a party and made a sexual advance. He said he contacted the website's reporter after being inspired by the Weinstein revelations. Spacey posted a statement on Twitter the next day saying he is beyond horrified by the story, but did not remember the alleged incident. 
He also apologized for what would have been a deeply inappropriate drunken behavior. But with the second half of his statement, Spacey sparks a fresh controversy when he comes out of the closet as a gay man in response to Rapp's accusation, prompting a torrent of accusations from the LGBTQ community for conflating alleged pedophilia with homosexuality. Not the best time to come out, if that was the true intention there. I get people need to come out on their own time, but kind of using it as a defense for molesting someone, probably not that time. The same day, actor Roberto Cavazos claims in a post on his Facebook account that he had a couple of unpleasant encounters with Spacey when the two were both performing at the Old Vic, including allegedly being squeezed by Spacey in the Old Vic bar. Now, Kevin Spacey could be a topic all on his own with how many accusations are against him and his own upsetting reactions to these victims stepping forward. But how does Disney fit into this? Well, as it turns out, he worked on A Bug's Life as the character Hopper. He also worked on Iron Will and The Ref. The charges against him have been dropped. Some say because of key pieces of evidence are missing and an accuser pleading the fifth, a whole variety of reasons, really. Many people still consider him to be guilty and consider his harmful action to have been an open secret among Hollywood circles. Does this mean Disney knew about his actions when they hired him? No, I have no way of knowing that, but it still falls into the extremely gray area that Disney apparently really likes to place themselves. It's not just their actors either, but this goes all the way to the top. In 2019, the former vice president of Disney, Michael Laney, was convicted for sexually abusing a young girl. Court documents state that he began abusing her in 2009 and there were multiple incidents spanning about two years. Another person reported this as far back as 2007, though the court couldn't find sufficient evidence to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Laney has been sentenced to six years in prison. Again, I truly don't want to speculate too much about Disney's intentions here, but considering that many child abusers do reoffend and many victims don't report, I'm concerned that he was doing this while he was the vice president when he had access to many children. I don't really wanna speculate any further than that because as of writing this, there's no proof that that's actually the case, but it's something I wish Disney would think about and take more seriously. Instead, you know, they just making their company apparently a haven for people with unsavory pasts. Like I just, it's shocking to me. This is all shocking that the list keeps going. Now I've actually talked about this guy before, but Brian Peck is another excellent example of this. Brian was convicted of sexually abusing children on Nickelodeon. And I mentioned that in my Nickelodeon episode, yet Disney hired him too, to work, you know, alongside children, even after the fact, according to the Daily Mail. Perhaps most disturbingly, he is only prohibited from direct contact with children, not from being a part of productions in which children are acting. Meaning that since convicted, he has worked on a Disney show and a horror movie set in a high school. He played a sex ed teacher according to the movie's credits. Peck 54 was convicted in 2004 of a lewd act against a child and oral copulation of a person under 16. In court documents obtained by Daily Mail Online, the victim was only named as John Doe to protect his identity. The child did not want his identity revealed for fear of it having a negative effect on his career. Peck had been coaching the youngster and acting at his home when the offenses happened and was only arrested after the budding actor's parents reported him to police. The documents show Peck was originally charged with 11 counts, including lewd act upon a child, sodomy of a person under 16, attempted sodomy of a person under 16, sexual penetration by a foreign object, four counts of oral copulation of a person under 16, oral copulation by anesthesia or controlled substance, sending harmful matter and using a minor for sex acts. Now, I know Daily Mail isn't the most reliable source, but the Washington Times has also confirmed that Peck, who served 16 months in present, worked on Disney's The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody in 2006 to 2007, and had an uncredited role in the 2009 movie, Jack and the Beanstalk. Yet just two years after his conviction, Disney hired him to work with minors. To put a known child molester on the set with children is gross. There's literally no excuse for it. I don't know why they did it. And the list, by the way, this whole list we're going through, it's practically endless. Recently, That's So Raven star Kyle Massey was accused of sending explicit photos and videos of himself to a 13 year old girl. Other teens have stepped forward and said that the 29 year old has been doing this for almost a decade now. Stoney Westmoreland is another Disney actor, well, a former actor now, who was fired after his arrest for attempting to sleep with an online acquaintance he believed was 13 years old. His agent, Mitchell Stubbs, is an enabler who said that while he would normally drop a client after this, he said that he hoped to work with him again in the future. Again, the priorities in Hollywood are absolute garbage. 
All the way back in 2012, Disney was hit with another lawsuit when Kelly Rodriguez says that when she attended a December 2011 taping of Good Luck Charlie, she was spanked against her will and kissed inappropriately by crowd entertainer Ron Pearson. Reuters reported, the lurid saga began when Rodriguez went to use the restroom and noticed Pearson looking up and down plaintiff's body in a lewd manner, the lawsuit says. Things went from ew to worse when, according to Rodriguez, she was chosen by Pearson along with two other audience members to take the stage and participate in a contest that involved doing a silly dance to the Village People's YMCA. But what happened next was anything but silly, Rodriguez claims. According to the suit, the silly dance, Pearson began spanking her while her back was turned to him. This unwarranted and unconsented spanking was relentless and did not cease until plaintiff physically turned around to stop it, the suit says. Following the contest, Rodriguez claims, Pearson asked her for a kiss on the cheek. Being a good sport, the suit says, she consented, but when she went in to give him a peck, Pearson turned his face and kissed plaintiff fully on the mouth. And this has also bled into their music company. John Healy, the director of music publishing, was also charged with three felony accounts of child abuse back in 2017. Variety writes, Healy, 58 of Santa Clarita, is accused of sexually abusing two underage girls approximately a decade ago. He allegedly victimized the first girl when she was about 15. According to the charges, he began abusing the second girl when she was about 11 years old and continued until she was 15. In a statement, a Disney spokesman said the company suspended Healy late on Friday after being informed of the charges. Immediately upon hearing of the situation tonight, he has been suspended without pay until the matter is resolved by the courts, the spokesman said. Some sources claim that the alleged crimes were not connected in any way to his employment with Disney. These weren't children that worked at Disney, but they were young female family members. Not that this makes it any better. Yet this list keeps going on and on and on. The reason why I want to present so many of these cases is that all I can do is try and prove that there's a pattern, that this is consistent, frequent, and it makes it all the more disgusting that Disney doesn't address it. Keith Thomas, a producer that worked for Hollywood Records and thereby its parent company, Disney, allegedly molested John Pruitt when she was a teenager. This all started when I was about 13 and the advances really kind of started around 14, but nothing was ever sexual until I was about 15. I can remember him saying, you know, let me teach you how to kiss. You don't wanna get out into the world and be a bad kisser. I vividly remember that. Again, I struggle considering Fox News a source, but considering that it's a direct quote from Jordan that she has stated these things, that's why I'm letting it happen here because it's a direct quote. (laughs) Hell, the head of animation for Disney and Pixar himself, John Lasseter, stepped down in 2018 after several people stepped forward and accused him of frequently grabbing, kissing, and making comments about their physical attributes during company events. Robert Iger, the CEO, issued a statement praising Lasseter when he stepped down, praising him for, quote, reinventing the animation business, taking breathtaking risks, and telling original high quality stories that will last forever. We are profoundly grateful for his contributions, end quote. Disney said Lasseter would take on a consulting role for the company through the end of the year and then step down permanently. This is so incredible to me because your head of animation is accused of assaulting like multiple people. And instead of going, we need to investigate this and this is unacceptable. They just go, John was a great talented guy and we're so grateful for him. It's a little bit more than upsetting. It's a direct slap in the face to everyone who has had to deal with Lasseter's groping and misconduct. With the amount of abuse, pedophilia, and sexual assault happening at Disney from a cast member at a park to the head of animation, you'd think that Disney would at least be somewhat concerned. But as far as I can see, Disney has never treated these cases that way, and I'm not sure they ever will. When Lasseter stepped down, one former employee said that the rampant sexism at Pixar, a subsidiary of Disney since 2006, has always been a problem, and it goes far beyond Lasseter's actions. Cassandra Smolsek called the culture openly abusive and said that from 2009 to 2014, when she worked there, she was told the COO had a hard time controlling himself around young women. Smolsek said that Lassiter would give her and countless other women lecherous up and down looks, unwanted hugs and touches, and that quote, the entire Pixar workforce witnessed the sleazy spin that John brought to Pixar's Halloween bash. If he found a woman attractive when she got on stage, he'd ask her to spin around while he made suggestive comments, turning the event into yet another lewd spectacle, end quote. 
When Smolsik gave her notice to quit, one supervisor told her, I'm really gonna miss the view. This happened with other studios Disney owns too, such as ABC. Greg St. John's director of photography for Criminal Minds was a camera operator for ABC. When St. John's worked for ABC, he apparently sexually assaulted and harassed multiple employees, yet all of it was tolerated. There's just, there's just so much sexual assault happening at Disney and their subsidiaries that it's just, I, I don't even think I can cover it all. We're, are we 30 minutes in? We're like 30 minutes into this. And when I say I haven't even covered a majority of the cases, I mean it. Demi Lovato has additionally also stated that when she was 15 years old, she was raped and it was completely swept under the rug. And she claims that she told somebody of power about it, but nothing was done. And that the actor who did it to her is still in the movie they had been acting in. The fact that Demi and so, so many other people like her have faced sexual harassment in this company is bad enough. It says loud and clear that Disney needs to seriously reconsider the people they hire, have more security in place, stricter policies, like better background checks, like something. This whole sweeping issues under the rug attitude and Hollywood's ridiculous amount of sexual abusers and pedophiles is disturbing enough. The fact that Disney, a company that markets itself towards children, does it is unfortunately not surprising, but it's incredibly disgusting. And this is actually where I intended on ending this portion of the episode, but just as I was getting ready to record this, news was released that 17 people were arrested in an undercover child predator sting in Florida. Three of them were Disney employees and nine of them had criminal records. It's unclear as of writing this about an update or anything, cause it's obviously gonna be probably swept under the rug, but either way, Disney is once again, probably showing how little they care about the children within their parks for knowingly hiring child predators as they've done in the past. According to my source, the Disney World employees include Savannah Lawrence, 29 of Kissimmee and Jonathan McGrew, 34 of Kissimmee, who worked as custodians at Walt Disney's Hollywood Studios, WFLA reported. Judd said the couple wanted to engage in a threesome with who they believed was a 13 year old girl and role play as step parents and stepdaughter in a shoplifting scenario, the television station reported. Jonathan said to the child, we want to enjoy this opportunity. We don't want to rush. Even at the conclusion, maybe we can cuddle a little bit, Judd told reporters. Are you kidding me? That's how you talk to 13 year old children? The other Disney employee was Kenneth Javier Aquino, 26, a lifeguard at Disney Animal Kingdom Lodge, Judd said. He left his girlfriend, who is seven months pregnant with his child, to have sex with a child, Judd told reporters. He's a Navy veteran, Judd told reporters. That's right. He was working toward a dive team or a SEAL team or some kind of special ops job. So if you have children, apparently be careful because they're just free roaming out there. It's genuinely like, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this, how this could all be possibly true, if not for so many different news articles and collaborative pieces of information to corroborate all of this. It's just, I am, it's not that I'm disbelieving it, it's just, it's unfathomable that this is a company marketed for children and and that this is what, my God. I could speak even further on the issue, obviously, as Disney has handled themselves abysmally throughout the years and with cases such as these, but I think and I hope I have hammered the point home well enough today. For any of you that did happen to make it through this episode, um, I, uh, hey, we, we made it barely, but we did. Hopefully I'll see you all in the next episode. Do something happy today. This really sucked to research and I'm sure you don't feel really great walking away from this, but hopefully you were able to learn something from this at least. So thanks for making it and I'll see you in the next one.